the church yesterday, and the preacher preached on repentance. And it was so good that I thought I'd bring it up and read it to y'all. Uh, it's a Psalm of David. This, this morning is um, Psalms 51. It's a prayer of repentance from David. And it's after David has sinned with Bathsheba. And David was a man of God. And the reason David was a man of God, even after his sin, was that David acknowledged his sin and asked God for forgiveness. And that made David um, a good man. Well, we're not, none of us are good. I shouldn't say good. I should say um, he acknowledged his sin, which is something that we need to do. Even if we don't sin a lot, even if we don't cuss, even if we don't drink, even if we don't talk mean to our parents or our children, we still have sin in our lives. There's sin in our lives no matter what. And according to the Bible, if we say there's no sin, and we say we have no sin in our life, then we're in fact a liar, which is a sin, okay? So um, we have to accept the fact that we're sinners. I can remember one time I asked my Granny Benefield if she was saved. And she said yes, and she came out with the reasons why she thought she was saved, which aren't really the biblical reasons as to why you would feel like you were saved. It was more um, her works and the things that she had done that she felt like saved her. You know, those were the reasons she was saved. She also believed that once you were saved, you didn't sin anymore. And so I said, well, do you sin? And she said, no. And so we need to understand, even my granny, and I remember when I did it, her kids got mad at me. She was elderly. Um, and they felt like I shouldn't say anything like that to her, that it worried her, and that I was out of place because she was a godly woman and was in church every time the, door, every time the doors were opened. But let me just say this, if you are saved and you're secure in your salvation, it wouldn't matter who asked you about your salvation, it wouldn't matter how old you were or where you were, you should be happy to tell them the story. You should never feel offended by someone asking you your salvation story or whether or not you're saved because that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and Granny really felt like she didn't sin. Granny just wasn't, um, even if she went to church every time the doors were open, she still wasn't, she really hadn't learned a lot, okay? A lot of us can go to church, but if that's all we do is go to church and then we read our Bible a little bit, we, we're, we don't study the Word of God. And after I did say that to my Granny, she started reading the Bible daily. And she was reading through the Bible. And I believe she got all the way through the Bible and started reading it again. And I believe me asking her that is what triggered her to do that. Now, it made her kids mad and it made them mad at me. But I'm sure God wasn't mad about it. And I'm sure that uh, Granny, I don't know. I think it upset her to begin with. But I think maybe after she thought about it, maybe she wasn't upset but remember that if you ever get offended or upset because somebody asks you about your salvation and you tell them why you feel like you're saved and they kind of bring up why you may not be, I mean, you should never get offended no matter what if you're saved. Um, anyway, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved because our daddy was a preacher or because we've been to church every time the doors are open or because we know Jesus is the Son of God, or because we know the stories in the Bible. That's not what saves us. God's grace saves us. God's grace gives us faith. God's word is full of it. And if we, um, we have to understand that it's nothing we've done, nothing about who we are, nothing about any of that, because it's Jesus' blood that saves us in his grace. So we can't lose it. 
because we can't gain it on our own. It's all from Him, okay? So once you're saved, you're always saved, um, and we're only saved through Jesus Christ, His blood that was shed for our sin, okay? Not um, what a lot of people think is salvation. So I'm going to read this to you. It's the, it's, it's the um, prayer of repentance. And if you've never had a feeling of repentance, then you've never felt the need for Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And if you've never felt the repentance, then more than likely you're not saved. But I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to listen to it. It's from David after he had sinned with Bathsheba. Now, this is in the Old Testament. So, of course, Jesus wasn't around the Holy Spirit to save David the way the Holy Spirit saves us now. Um, but it's perfect the way he spells everything out for us. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned the, and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. That the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now listen, this was in the Old Testament before the Holy Spirit was even around. And do you hear how he's praying? It is so Jesus and salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed O God the God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness O Lord open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. Okay, this is a cry of repentance. This is about salvation. David has sinned against God. And he makes a point to say, I have sinned against you and you only now. When we sin, we may hurt people's feelings, but the one that's the most important is that we don't hurt God's feelings. A lot of people, and I said this the other day when I was cooking, about Daddy. Well, for one, he's not, sa he's not saved, I don't believe, in my heart. But one thing that I did say is that he didn't live with his girlfriend until his parents were passed away. And I said, if he felt like it was wrong, 
then he he did it out of respect for his parents, okay? So Daddy thought, you know, Daddy knows biblical stuff, and he did it out of respect for his parents, okay? But who should we really be doing things for? Not our parents, not out of respect for our parents, not our children, but God, okay? I remember also, and I mean, I, it's not like I'm perfect either, y'all. But I remember also, these are just good examples. My mother, after she divorced, um, her mom and dad were passed away. And after my, actually, after my papa passed away, he was a Baptist minister. Mama had been to church her whole life. During the time that we were children, she went by herself with us because my daddy never went unless it was a special occasion. And as soon as her father died, Mama quit going to church. Okay? So, was she going to church for God? Or was she going to church for herself? Or was she going to church for her parents? Now, the Bible does say that we should do respect our parents. Um... But we need to think about why we do the things we do. Do we do them for other people? Or do we do them because we have the right heart that God wants? Okay? Now, I'm the same way. When I was a kid, when I was 14 years old, I quit going to church. Um, I can't remember if... Papa didn't die until I was up in my 20s, I think. And I quit going to church when I was a teenager because I didn't like it anymore. Just like my kids don't like church. They don't go to church with me and Chris. Two weeks ago, we said, look, y'all need to go to church. Um, and they were fussing because they were having to go with us because they don't like this new preacher because, boy, does he step on your toes. I just love him. And they decided they didn't want to go to church there. And, and Chris said, fine, I didn't go to church with my parents when I was your age. I went to another church. So you're going to go to church somewhere, so get in the car and go somewhere else. But you're going somewhere. So they went down the road where, you know, it's dark in there, and they play the bands and the loud music and all that stuff, which is fine. But whether or not they ever get convicted, who knows? You know, to me, when you go to church, you shouldn't just feel good when you walk out. Sometimes you should feel guilty because let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. The Bible says that God is good. Okay? But there's none good. No, not one. None of us are good. All of us are sinners. The preacher's a sinner. We're a sinner. Everybody on the face of the earth is a sinner. Even if we're saved, we still sin. Sin is abundant and around us and in us. And it's up to us to cleanse our to, to cleanse ourselves and want to be um, the right person. Um, he made me feel guilty yesterday when he preached. Because I'm guilty. I'm guilty because when I went to see Mama and they hadn't bathed her in a week, and I'm pretty sure it went two weeks that they haven't bathed her. Now, i got to go back in there this week. But the Bible says, be angry and sin not. And I didn't do that. When I went in there, I was ugly. And I let some curse words fly, and I was mad, and I raised my voice. So, um, and I'm human, and it's my mama, and I was just mad. Does that make it right? No. Because the Bible says, be angry and sin not. And that's not what I did. That's not a good example. Um, I should have been angry, of course. It's not, a, it's not a sin to be angry, but it is a sin to act upon your anger, okay? So I've got to write a letter this week, and I've got to go in there. I've got to schedule a meeting, and I've got to go in there calm, sit down at the table, and have a list of the things that I feel like they haven't done, and do it right, okay? Um, but what I liked about this psalm and there's several things that we need to take out of this psalm, okay? And it says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. 
Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I, I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. We need to acknowledge our sin, okay? Now, if you're sitting there, like the preacher said, and you're saying, oh, I don't, I don't have any sin in my heart. I don't have any sin in my life. According to the Bible, there's not one good, no, not one. So if you're sitting there thinking that you have no sin, then the Bible says you're a liar. It even has an, in here, there's a verse about if you, if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. And um, I, I'll look it up before we go. But anyway, and then if you're a liar, what is that? A sin. So we have to acknowledge our transgressions, okay? We have to acknowledge our sin, and we have to know that we sin against God, not against the person uh, that's in our lives, not against our parents, not against our children, but God. Because only God is good. Only God is righteous. Only God sent his son here to die for our sin. Only God can save us. And it's only God that we need to be looking up to and trusting. Okay? Um, he also told God, he started out uh, acknowledging his sin. And then once he acknowledged his sin, he asked God to give him a clean heart. Okay? Um... And that's a big deal. Now, once he had the clean heart, then he goes ahead after that. Listen to this. This is something nobody does. Nobody, hardly anybody does this anymore except a pastor. And it's not just the pastor's place. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me to be your generous spirit. Then I, will then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Now, how many people do you know that actually ask people if they know who God is? If they know what sin is? If they're saved, hardly nobody. My grandmother was probably in her close to, let's see, she was probably in her late 80s when I asked her about her salvation. And apparently nobody ever asked her. Uh, just because somebody's in the church every time the doors are open doesn't mean they can't be asked about their salvation story. Now, she lived to be 80-something years old. And nobody had ever approached her. So when I approached her, everybody got mad at me because they thought it was, um, they thought I was being disrespectful to a woman that was my grandmother that was godly, that had worked in the church her whole life, was in the church every time the doors were open. They thought it was disrespectful for me to ask her her salvation story. That just shows how the world is today. That just shows how we think today. That just shows that nobody does what you're supposed to do when you're saved. It says plainly, Then I will tr teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation. Now, did that mean my granny wasn't saved? No. Only God knows if granny was saved. But it did mean that she really didn't know what salvation, the true salvation, was. So many preachers get up and they talk about stuff. And they don't teach their congregations what it means to be saved. I know that's true because my best friend went to church every time the doors were open. And when I asked her, was she saved? She said, what do you mean saved? And she didn't have a clue. She goes to church. And I'm like... You know, have you ever accepted Christ as your Savior? 
And she just looked at me. I said, have you, you know, have you ever felt like you were guilty? Have you ever, um, you know, told God that you, that you uh, were a sinner and that you were sorry and that you needed a Savior? And she didn't have a clue. And a lot of people get saved and they're in the church and they don't even know what it means to be saved. They don't even know that the Holy Spirit comes to live in their heart. Uh, and some, and if they are saved, I'm sure the Holy Spirit's there, but we can quench it. So salvation is real and it's not complicated at all. It's very simple. It's only by God's grace that we're saved. And he has to give us the grace in order for us to open our ears and our hearts to believe it. Um, but it's up to us to tell people what salvation is. It's up to us to tell people the good news. It's up to us to tell who Jesus is. It's up to us to ask our children and our grandchildren their salvation story so that we can get a picture of what they think salvation really is because we don't want them to go to a real hell. It's real. And we don't even ask our family members, hey, are you saved? Do you know what salvation is? Can you tell me your salvation story? I'd love to hear it. Anybody that's saved is happy and excited and should be ready, no matter under what circumstance, to tell their salvation story. Everybody. Are you ready to tell your salvation story? Can you tell your salvation story? If you can, you should. Write it down. Write it down and meditate on it. And that way, if somebody ever asks you, you can tell them. Start asking people you know if they're saved. It's not wrong to do. It's right to do. He asks us to do it. So I just want to say that to you because so many people. Do you know that I did never have one family member ask me, was I saved? I've never had a family member. I don't think, I don't know that I've ever had a person, but maybe once asked me, was I saved? And I'm 48 years old. Now these kids go off to college and they forget who God is. I did too. I mean, I quit going to church when I was 14. I was saved, um, but I was backslid. And I didn't, you know, I wanted to live the way I wanted to live, and I didn't want to feel guilty. And at first I felt guilty, and then after a while I didn't feel guilty anymore. And we could do that too, okay, if we get far enough away from God. We could quench the Holy Spirit, and he just quits even saying anything to us because it don't do any good. And I was there, but I know I was saved. Um, I've never worried about if I was saved or not. I've never had... Um, second guesses if I was saved or not um, because I know I'm saved um, but I got saved when I was a kid I'll tell you and the preacher was preaching on hell <laughs> and a lot of people think that if the preacher preaches on hell and you get saved that you're really not saved I remember when I got saved my mama said I didn't get saved I remember it plain as day I remember standing behind that pew. I remember clenching that top of that pew in front of me as tight as I could with my hands. I remember, y'all, feeling guilty. I remember feeling like a sinner. I remember feeling like I was going to go right to hell. I knew I deserved hell. I knew it. I was a child, but I knew it. I could feel it. I could see it. It was real. I was convicted. I knew that I was a sinner. And I went up to that aisle and told God. I mean, it's not really a sinner's prayer. All you got to do is surrender, okay? Um, when you go to that, uh, when you go up there to that front of that church, uh, really, when you when you stand up and start to walk, you're already saved. It's not what we say to God at all that saves us. It's what we believe in our heart. It's a broken and contrite heart, not something we come out with in our mouth. 
But then after we're saved, we are supposed to tell people. We are supposed to be excited. We are supposed to let people know and not be ashamed. Um, but I remember plain as day being saved. I know I got saved. I've never even one time felt like I wasn't saved. Let me say this. If you feel like, or there's times, because God don't visit you ever, all the time. It's just uh, every once in a while. And if you've ever felt like you weren't saved, a lot of people say that's the devil trying to get you to feel like you're not saved. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard because why would the devil want you to think that you're not saved. The devil it wants to say so far away from salvation, it's pathetic. If you weren't saved, he sure wouldn't remind you that you weren't saved because he's happy if you're not saved. You know who reminds you that you're not saved? God or the Holy Spirit. They're the ones that want your salvation. They're the ones that want you to be saved. Thinking that the devil makes you worry about your salvation or wonder about your salvation is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, and preachers even say it, because the devil could care less. Matter of fact, the devil don't want you to be, so he sure wouldn't remind you that you wouldn't, okay? Um, so if you've ever had a feeling that you weren't, um, then, you know, maybe you should read um, another book that's good to, to know if you're saved. Is one of the Goths, let's see, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's one of the, it's in the New Testament. It may be Ephesians, but I can't remember. I'll have to ask Chris. But there's a book in the Bible that if you read it, you should know if you're saved or not. You know, it just, you know, it's one of those. Um, it reminds you about what salvation is, and you should be reminded of, the, of your salvation when you read it. Um, but anyway, I'll ask him about it, and Friday I'll tell y'all which book it is. I used to have my Bible that I used to use all the time um, in the ministry. When me and Chris were actually, uh, we did singles for years and years at, at the church we went to, and I had a Bible that uh, my cousin actually sent me, and it was about to fall to pieces. I used it so much. But I had all my notes in the front, all my notes in the back. And I could guide somebody through Christ. And I could tell them what to read, you know. And I didn't write it down in my new Bibles. And I need to look for that Bible and fix these newer Bibles with that information so that when I can't remember, I can tell it. Because, y'all, I can't remember everything like Chris can. Chris can remember everything. If you ask him anything, he knows where it is. And if you look it up in the Blue Letter Bible, it'll tell you too. But anyway, I've talked a lot today. It's 826, but I'm excited. Let me tell you what, that preacher gets me so excited for God. I love him. He is on fire with the Holy Spirit. I just love him. Um, and I know you're not supposed to love a preacher, but I mean, you know, I don't love him. I love God working through him. How's that? Um, he's amazing. Um he, he had a real, lot of really good points yesterday, way more than I have. Um, but I just hope y'all think on that this morning. Think on what your salvation story is. Share it with us. I mean, y'all can make comments. Share your salvation story. Write it down, paraphrase it, and share it. Or share it on your wall. Or... Ask your children, your own children, are you saved? Can you tell me what your salvation story is? Chris's daddy, one time when Chris was a teenager and the preacher said, are you saved? Chris was feeling guilty. He raised his hand. His daddy said, Chris, you got saved when you were little. So he didn't pursue it. Chris didn't get saved until after we were married. And I thought he was saved. He read the Bible every day. But he didn't get saved until after we were married. And he was in his, it was after we moved here. He was probably in his late 30s or early 40s. Um, so ask your children. Just because they went up to the front of the aisle and they've been baptized, don't necessarily mean they're saved. they got to know what being saved means. 
They got to remember it. If you can't remember the day you got saved, if you can't remember feeling like you were a sinner going to hell, then you're probably not saved. Because if you're saved, you're going to feel repentance. You're going to feel like you need a savior. You're going to be scared to death of hell. That's real. That's what conviction is. And you can't be saved without it. Okay? It's not just a matter of, oh, I believe who he is. God believes uh, the devil knows who Christ is. The devil knows all about him. Uh, but, uh, knowing is one thing. Believing is another. Okay? Let's start asking people in our lives whether or not they have a salvation story. And let's start sh sharing stuff with them. It's not just the preacher's responsibility. It's everybody who's saved responsibility to share the good news. Um, that's one reason I do it on here. I know I don't get a lot of viewers. I know I'll probably lose some viewers for it. But you know what? If one person gets saved, if it takes me five years of doing this for one person to get saved, it's worth it. Okay? It's worth it. Because it's what God has commanded us and me to do. Okay? Y'all have a wonderful day. Let's say our prayers. I've preached enough this morning. I don't preach. Um, and I'm an old-fashioned woman. So if y'all believe in women preachers, I'm sorry, I don't. I believe in women teachers for women. But I think men ought to teach the family. I think men ought to teach the word. Men are the head of the household. I think men ought to be the spiritual head of the family. Now, I know there's a lot of men out there that aren't. Uh, and I know there's a lot of women that are. But if you are a woman with a man that's not spiritual, and you are spiritual, don't act like you're more spiritual than he is. You can know it in your heart and not say it. Because it, it's just, it's not good. It's not good because he's the head, okay? And the bad thing is that you became unequally yoked with somebody anyway, but if you did, uh, respect you staying with them, but you can't pretend or even think in your heart that you're this wonderful spiritual person and your husband is not. It's, it's just not nice, okay? Because it'll reflect in your marriage and it'll reflect in your relationship and it'll reflect upon your children. And it is it just will not be a good thing for y'all. You're not going to be blessed for it, okay? Um, I know a woman who is so spiritual, and she knows a lot about the Bible. And her husband's a spiritual man, too. He's in the church. And she feels like she's so much more spiritual and knowledgeable than he is. And what she don't realize is, um, I mean, I can see it all over her. I can tell it any Bible study I went to under her. And what she don't realize is that that's a sin. And, and she um, is proud. proud. And pride is sinful. And she uh, needs to be more humble and give her husband more credit. Uh, where credit is due, right? Um, of course, my husband's real smart, way smarter than me. So it's easy for me to say. Uh, but it's just something you got to be careful with. All right, let's say our prayers, and um, I guess I'll see y'all Friday. I want to I want to touch on cursing, and um, just see I'm gonna see what I can find in the Bible because cursing in the Bible, um, so far it has just been like if someone curses you, like wants evil to come upon you. Uh, which is different than what we say a curse word is, okay? So I've got to find it and really study it before I can go through that. Um, I guess the main thing is that we know that cursing, I don't know, we'll talk about it Friday. How's that? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for David, a man you used that sinned and acknowledged his sin and asked for forgiveness, a man that was after your own heart. It shows us that we are sinners, that we will do things that are bad, and that you will forgive us if we 
see that we're guilty. We have to see that we're guilty, Lord, and we thank you for the examples that you've given in, in your word to show us that we should feel guilty, we should acknowledge our sin and bring it to you so that we can have a clean heart and share your good news with others. Lord, help us understand that our hearts need to be cleaned um, and help us to understand that our hearts are, uh, your word says that our hearts are deceitfully wicked. Um, so without you, Lord, um, we're wicked. There's so many people in this world that think that they're good or they think that they have a good life without you. And wisdom comes from your word and they're just not wise. Um, we pray for those people. We pray for those around us. We pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to share your word, to ask our family members if they're saved, um, and get everyone prepared for heaven so that we don't leave any of our loved ones here behind. Or even strangers, we should love them just as much as we love ourselves. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I love y'all.